everybody in this room from a very boring presentation. <laughs> Uh, so our next presenter is going to be Alexander Kleppel and he's going to be talking to us about virtualization automation using Ansible and I actually know him from school, we both went to UTSA together and uh, he's a great guy and I know for a fact that he, he has a lot of experience with virtualization so you guys will enjoy this. And so we want to thank our sponsors. Our gold level sponsors are St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, SANS Institute, and then our silver level sponsors are National Security Agency, Exabeam, Accenture Federal Services, Open Security, Titanium Level, Cyber Tech Jobs, Denim Group. Alamo ISSA and Landmark Solutions, and enjoy. Thank you so much. All right, can everybody hear me okay, or do I need to pick up and hold the mic? I can hear you back here. You can hear me in the back? That's great. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right, I know it's right after lunch. Everybody's got a new beer. How's everybody doing today? That's what I want to hear. Welcome to Virtualization Automation with Ansible. I am Alexander Kleppel, and I'm here to talk to you guys today. I am a graduate of the University of Texas at San Antonio. I have a Bachelor's of Business Administration in Cybersecurity and a BBA in Information Systems. I was on the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition Team. Uh, I ran the competition team my senior year. I was a member and then treasurer and then president of our Computer Security Association. And that's you know what really ignited my passion for security. Now I work at Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, a federal defense contractor. I serve as the cyber SME and dream shatterer on my team and as the intern liaison, so managing a small army of people that are a lot smarter than you sometimes can be a little scary. Hi, Josh. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to talk about today is building your own cyber range and the best way to go about that. But in order to do that, we have to first talk about what a cyber range is, why you would want one, how you make one, and if there are better ways to do it. We'll talk about some virtualization and the differences between different types of virtualization, and you know it seems really, really hard. And then we'll automate all of the difficult stuff and make it super, super easy. Everybody on board? All right. So, what is a cyber range? You can think of it as a digital playground, a shooting range, or a bit of both. It can be a classroom, it can be a malware lab, it can be anything that you would want a bunch of computers connected together to do. It can contain a mix of server platforms, regular workstation platforms, networking gear, anything your heart desires. You can simulate your own uh, network operation center or security operation center. You can set it up for red as an offensive, blue as in defensive, head-to-head -head, uh, training exercises. Why would I want a cyber range? The short answer is practice. Why would you want to practice? Because the bad guys are. You should too. You can also perform learning and assessment of learning through monitored cyber ranges. You're able to receive real-time feedback on what people are doing within your cyber range, the things they're learning, the things they're not learning. And you can test out new ideas and techniques without breaking your production environment. Who here has broken something in production? This is why you don't want to do that. 
All right, cyber ranges. Who really needs a cyber range? Professionals like myself to hone their own craft. Organizations like the one that I work for for evaluating their techniques. Uh, educators such as you know uh, your professors, your teachers, you if you're providing mentorship to anyone, uh, so that you can give students a place to learn, and students themselves to learn without consequences. I'm a firm believer that if you're not learning something new every single day in this field, you're falling behind. So building yourself a cyber range will give you the means to be able to do so. All right, have I convinced you guys on wanting a cyber range? Yes. 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 Have I convinced you? Yes. Yes. All right, all right. Just take my money. <laughs> All right. So there's there's two real good ways to go about this: a physical lab and a virtual lab. Physical lab. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not always that much of a dumpster fire. Sometimes it's like this. Drawbacks to having a physical lab include the equipment costs of having, you know, all of your workstations or all of your laptops, all of your cables, all of your networking gear, all of this, all of that. Everything's just all over the place. You got to find a place to store it. It just takes up way too much room and it needs constant maintenance. One thing breaks, you swap it out with a spare. Your spare breaks, you swap it out with your spare spare. Eventually you run out of spares and you run out of time to fix things because you're too busy playing in your brand new cyber range. So let's go the easy way. Let's virtualize our lab. It's a much more cost-effective solution because you can narrow it down to a single server. You don't need a bunch of things networked together to have a decent-sized cyber playground. You can change it dynamically. You are able to you know, create snapshots and go back in time and just fiddle around with it without the worries and woes of breaking expensive equipment. Usually it also makes a much smaller physical footprint. I would rather carry on the road a single server, as much as I would hate to, instead of 30 to 50 laptops. There are some things that we need to talk about before we can talk about virtualization as a whole. Uh, what is virtualization? Is anybody in the room not familiar with virtualization? All right, too bad, because I'm going to explain it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> virtualization is technology that allows you to run a computer on another computer. And it's traditionally bound uh, you know, uh, it's useful for running resources that are traditionally bound to hardware. Uh, so take your computer, squash it down, run it on another computer. Using a hypervisor. A hyper what? You would say if you weren't familiar with virtualization. <laughs> uh, that's the software that lets um, your computer run another computer. It's divided into the host operating system and guest operating systems. And there are two types of hypervisors, unless you're a hypervisor snob and think there's only really one. Um, the easiest distinction between them is type one and type two. Uh, so running on bare metal or on my super powerful gaming laptop. Okay. So I've got this neat little graphic that I stole uh, that talks about the two different types of hypervisors. Here we have a type 1 hypervisor. It runs the actual operating system that runs your virtualized operating systems on the bare metal. And then you have your guest operating systems, which are your virtual machines. There's also a type 2 hypervisor. So this uh, host OS, this would be like your Windows, your Mac, your Linux. And then you run a hypervisor software on top of that, like VirtualBox or VMware Workstation, and then you're able to run your guests. 
So how would I go about doing this, you might ask? Well, type 2 is easiest at home if you don't already have this sort of equipment. You could download VirtualBox for free, VMware Player also for free, or VMware Workstation, which is definitely worth the extra money. If you've got extra hardware just laying around, my recommendation would be to go for a Type 1 hypervisor. I myself, I am very partial to VMware's ESXi platform, but uh, Microsoft also has their own virtualization platform called Hyper-V. It's included with Windows Server and also Windows 10 if you wanted to try that out. And you could also use OpenStack. Now some of you may say, wait a minute, OpenStack isn't really a hypervisor. Any, anybody in that camp? No? Okay. Well, I was going to say, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, what is it? A hypervisor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So why? Why would you choose ESXi? It's expensive. Not if you get the free version. <laughs> I use it a lot because it's you know, kind of what I grew up with. I used it in college. It's all good. I use it at home, in my own personal home lab. I use it at work. It has a very versatile API, so you're able to make sorts of calls to it with you know, some like integrated DevOps tools, like uh, this weird Ansible thing I've been hearing a little bit about lately. Um, I have the hardware at home, uh, my beautiful ProLiant. So why not use it? So making a virtual range manually, it can be time consuming, it can be painstaking, it can make you cry. It's done that to me. <laughs> Uh, you click through some prompts, you make your virtual machine, and you repeat it over and over and over until you have the range you want. So let's see how we go about making one virtual machine. So first things first, uh, you click on a create new virtual machine button. It's big, it's bold, it's beautiful, and that's why I didn't highlight it in the slide before. This is the important stuff. So uh, once you get to the create a virtual machine prompt, you just create a new virtual machine, you're going to click next, uh, you're going to name your virtual machine in this box, you're going to select your uh, guest OS, and if you remember back to the slide with the graphic that I shamelessly stole, that's the operating system that you're running as a virtual machine, and you're going to tell it uh, the specific version that you want to be running. You're going to select your storage. I happen to have a bunch of hard drives sitting in my server. And if we go to the next slide, this is where you would configure all of the sorts of hardware-based things that you, know, you would be used to if you were going to, say, PC part picker and building your own desktop. Always, 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 unless you have another good reason, under the part where it says hard disk, click on this little arrow here, and thin provision. Oh. Thin provision. Does anyone want to take a crack at why you would want to thin provision instead of just thick provision? Does anybody know the difference? Performance? Because I don't have 50 terabytes of storage. Storage space problems? Because thick provisioning already zeroes out ahead time versus thin provisioning, which zeroes out as you go. So it's a lot more efficient in that manner. Disk efficiency? <laughs> all right. Yes, all of those are very valid. If I ever run into you and I find out that you're thin provisioning on purpose and you don't have a like 500 word essay as to why, <laughs> After you've you know, thin provisioned, like you absolutely should, you're going to go down and select um, from your CD, DVD drive, and click the little drop down here, and then you're going to go through your folder paths to your beautiful ISO image so that you're able to actually install your operating system. That means you're done with your VM, right? No. 
Uh, now you need to actually configure it and install the operating system just like you would on regular hardware. So you're going to want to turn on your VM, either click the console button here or this big play button. I don't know why they're so close if they do the exact same thing. Uh, someone needs a new UX UI designer. So after you've clicked console, it brings up in your web browser a nice representation of what you would see if you were sitting in front of an actual computer. So you go ahead and install it, set it up the way that you want, install maybe some applications like your favorite web browser. Now you would have to do this over and over and over for each new machine you would want on your range unless you're paying uh, for the professional version of VSXi or for vSphere, which is their um, larger suite of tools that you can manage multiple individual ESXi hosts with. So, after you've made your virtual machine, uh, click on Actions and Install VMware Tools because that's very, very important for what we're about to do. It allows you to actually interface with the, the network cards and everything that runs under the hood. Wait a minute. I thought that this was a talk about Ansible. Yeah. That's what you guys are thinking, right? Yeah. All right, I'm sorry. We're getting there. All right, so let's get into Ansible. Has anybody here used Ansible? All right, a lot less than I thought. It's a great tool, great tool. It can totally reduce your workload and it's agentless. So how many of you are familiar with Chef? Okay, how many of you are familiar with Puppet? Okay, so you know how I have to install the Puppet agent on like every machine that you want to manage with it? Take that, remove having to install the agent, and you get Ansible. If you're able to ping it and you have appropriate credentials, you can manage it. You're able to take these long and difficult tasks like installing software or deploying virtual machines and turn them into uh, repeatable playbooks. It gives you everything that you need with you know, just the push of a button. And you can distribute that to teams to have you know, your lab replicated in other avenues. Uh, thank you so much to Red Hat for making this tool free and open source. You can find out more at Ansible.com and you can find it on GitHub under Ansible. All right, so the installation uh, as it is in my personal home environment, I'm a Windows guy. Uh, my handle is Bill Gates. I look just like his mugshot. Uh, so I'm using um, Windows 10 and Ubuntu through the Windows subsystem for Linux. So if you don't want to go out and buy another computer just to run Ansible, you're able to do that as well. So once you've got a WSL set up, you can run these commands. Uh, you want to update everything. You want to add the repository for Ansible, and then you want to install Ansible itself. All right, so where, where's my range? I'm, I've been expecting it, right? You need some more software. Uh, so you need Python, and to also interact with ESXi, you will need uh, this installed through pip. Uh, it's pyvmomi. I don't know what the OMI stands for, but I bet you I know what the VM stands for. <laughs> All right. So there is once you've got everything set up in your beautiful, beautiful Ansible installation, you'll want to check your Ansible host file. It's stored under Etsy Ansible Hosts, and this is where we'll tell um, Ansible what machines we want to have created. I know what it is that I'm building. So my host file has um, one of the headers set to Windows 7. 
so that I'm able to you know, know whenever I look at it, oh, what machines are running Windows 7? Well, it's the ones that have these IP addresses. Ansible uses uh, playbooks where Chef would use uh, recipes. Uh, think of these um, in terms of this talk as the guides to building your range. They'll control what it is that's happening within your environment. It uses the host file as the list of things that it wants to target. And if you use Ansible the normal way, you'll hate that I am constantly changing the host file and not keeping it static to a regular environment. I'm sort of using it backwards from the way that it's intended to be. Instead of changing playbooks, I'm changing the host file and then running playbooks against that. Ansible's playbooks are written in the uh, YAML format, so it's really easy to read, it's really easy to write. You're able to declare variables and prompts for variables so that you don't have to leave your password in plain text, which is great. This is how you would go about using those variables. So we have um, the the vSphere guest um, Ansible module, which comes completely already installed. Whenever you install Ansible, you don't have to go out and configure it a certain way or download other packages. You download Ansible, you get all of it. You would use the, the variables here with the, uh, the curly braces. Inventory host name. Here is the, uh, the VMware specific stuff. Uh, thin provisioning, the data store that you want to deploy it to, uh, the, the VM network, uh, if you have multiple uh, networks on your virtualized switch, you would you know, pick the one that you want here. I declare their IP addresses based on their host name in the inventory file. So the VMs that are created would have an IP address of 192.168.1.2 a host name of 192.168.1.2, and the actual virtual machine name is guess. All together now. All right, I know it's after lunch, everyone's a little sleepy. <laughs> Myself included. Template? What, what am I going to use for a template? Well, you remember that virtual machine that I walked us through making and clicking and picking things? We're just going to use that. So instead of um, remaking it over and over and over, we're going to let Ansible do the heavy lifting for us. So you just run the playbook. Uh, it's super, super easy. Ansible-playbook, the name of your playbook. It asks for the vSphere password, which is hidden whenever you actually type it out, which is great. It then prompts you for uh, VM notes. The default from what I defined in the Ansible playbook is deployed with Ansible. Uh, here I decided to say this is for B-Sides SATX 2019, because this is for B-Sides SATX 2019. It then asks you for the source VM to deploy. Um, back a few slides, remember I said make sure you name your VM. I didn't have the name in the slide, but it is besides underscore SATX. It goes and actually starts cloning that virtual machine template that you asked it to and deploys it onto your range. So Ansible gives you this nice little uh, summary of the things that it did. Okay, you told me to go look at these IP addresses. These are the things that changed. Okay, well, what changed? It's not exactly super intuitive on the command line to tell you what it is that has and has not changed. However, um, you wrote the playbook. You should know what it is that is changing before you run it. So here is my new beautiful range just like we declared in the host file. Other use cases for Ansible include deploying software. 
You can use Ansible um, to connect to things like Apt, or if you're on Windows, Chocolatey, to install software across both your cyber range and your own enterprise network. If you have custom applications like that you've written that you want to test in your range, you're able to do that as well. Uh, it's a little bit outside the, the scope of the talk that I have prepared, but I realize I'm talking really, really, really fast. So there will definitely be time for lots of questions. I hope you guys have some. Here are some useful links. Uh, we have the, the VMware Evaluation Center so that you can grab your free copy of ESXi. They have the, uh, the download for uh, the VMware vCenter server appliance, which is that thing that lets you manage multiple ESXi instances. Uh, Python. Ansible is actually written in Python, so that's super handy if you're already familiar with it. And I list the, the Ansible docs as useful, but not really. This is an actual screenshot of their documentation in regards to the VMware modules. There, there, there's, there's nothing there. So, so everything that you saw was just playing with the module and seeing what worked. Of course, I'm only here to show the successes. I'm not going to show you, you know, everything that I did that didn't work. All right, so I know I super, super, super went over time, uh, so I have plenty of time for questions. The playbook that I used for uh, deploying my range will be available up on my GitHub, and I'll post that link on my Twitter. Uh, feel free to you know, give that a look. I'm not asking you to follow me or anything, but uh, if you enjoyed it and you want to see more of this sort of stuff, you know, just let me know. And uh, feel free to send me a connection on LinkedIn and say, hey, I saw your talk at B-Sides. Could you help me with blah, blah, blah? And I'll see what I can do. But as of right now, um, I'm here to take questions. I, I want this to be a little more interactive. Really, no questions. So at my worst for the program we're developing, you have, you know, we have a separate you know, third-party installers, you know, the zip file, and whenever you want to go put it in a VM, you can make sure you go through all these um, installs before you run our product. Um, would Ansible be able to, you know, given a list of these installers, go through, run a little script that installs those? So, so the question was, if I have like a, a list of applications that need to be unzipped and installed, can I do that with Ansible? Yeah. The answer is yes. Absolutely. Policy administrator. I'm sorry. What was that? Deploys a lot of software packages to a lot of lot of nodes. You can do that. Absolutely. So not only are you able to utilize existing repositories like Apt or Chocolatey if you're on Windows, if you have you know custom applications like something I've I've written, we'll, we'll say uh, Hello World.exe. I could put that up on like a local web server and have Ansible say, hey, on 192.168.1.2, I want you to look at webserver.url and pull this package and install it. Chris, what happened on your laptop? <laughs> okay. So yes, you, you are able to do that both with publicly available repositories and a repository that you make. But that's a little bit outside the scope of, of what we're doing here. Why change the IP addresses in the host file and not in the recipe, in the playbook? So why use the host file instead of the playbook to declare your range? Because I'm lazy and the, the module wasn't working in you know, whenever you have... <laughs> whenever you have documentation like this, you find something that works 
and you stick to your guns, and it doesn't matter if it's wrong to everyone else in the answer community. Just stick to your guns because it works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Fair enough. <laughs> yes? What do you gain from putting Ansible on top of Chocolatey? Because Chocolatey has deployment capabilities. So, how big is your environment? Not. Pers it's a personal <laughs> environment. Yeah, right but, so if, if you were, the, the question, is the question complete? I'm sorry. No, it is. Yeah, okay. so. The, the question was, well, why would I run Ansible to run Chocolatey if I could just run Chocolatey? Scalability. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do I set up Arch with Ansible? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you wanted to install Arch with Ansible, I actually have a, a serious answer for that. Do it once manually, then do everything that I just presented on and deploy it to your range. So you mentioned every OS. What about Windows XP? Yes, you, you could manage XP. Very little, though, because you're able to still run uh, Windows shell commands through Ansible. How do you get the communication to work? It works over... Uh, so. Ansible interfaces with uh, Linux machines over SSH. There's no SSH on Windows XP. However, there is Windows Remote Management. So using WinRM, you're able to then remotely manage your machines at scale with Ansible. Have you done this in practice with XP? Yes. For fun, right? Yes. It's never something that I would ever do in production. <laughs> yes? As a playbook, could you set up, instead of making a VM and cloning it, could you set up it as, well as I'm going to use the word, an answer file for a boot and have it just kick something off and answer? S sort of. So, so the question was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, could I use Ansible to create like a, a VMware answer file which would just pre-configure the VM whenever it's being loaded? Um, I haven't seen a way to do that. I'd love to see it because it would save me uh, about half the time because whenever you run things through with Ansible, it's almost like you're running through it all uh, across the network at once. So it has to actually go through and set the IP addresses instead of just having them set up uh, at boot. That would be a very interesting thing to see and not something that I considered. So thank you. I have a question. Have you automated with salt and how do you do your So I have not used salt. So my comparison is, well, I've had chocolate but I've never had strawberry. I can't tell you which is better. <laughs> What's your plan for the next 27 minutes? Um, <laughs> I could run through it again. <laughs> yes? Is there a quick way to make a scalable format of a pseudo-random VM? So if I, I, I have usernames and password lists that I need to smatter across a bunch of machines, I don't want them to be the same across the whole environment. Yes, thank you so much for asking. That's something that I meant to actually include in these slides. Um, there is a with random choice variable that is available. Let's go back. Um, too far. That is available that you can actually set, um, like you can say with random choice username and you can provide a list of usernames with random choice password, provide a list of passwords, and it'll randomly generate these, these virtual machines and set up with that username and password. Can you do that with uh, software packages as well, dependencies? Yes. Uh, 
I'm sorry, could, could, you, could you ask that one more time before, uh, before another enthusiastic yes? So if, I, if, I've got enough, if I've got my packages laid out with vulnerable services, right? mm -hmm. but obviously it's not going to work across all the different flavors, but I need those other flavors in the environment. So I have to find the dependencies, yes. and it knows it needs those. It won't try to deploy them something that doesn't work. Right. So if uh, the, the question was, well, can, can I do that with software packages too? And the answer is yes. Uh, you are able to randomly select, uh, if you had a repository of vulnerable services, you could select from that list at random and have it also install the dependencies so long as you've defined them appropriately in your playbook. And if you use the with random choice, It'll go through and be like, oh, I need to install uh, Apache version 0.0.1 .0 and all of its dependencies, and you can do it randomly, which is really beautiful if you want to, say, create a mock penetration test sort of lab environment. All right, well, I don't think there are any more questions, and I totally blew through my slides. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Again, I'll put up the, um, the, the playbook that I used for deploying this range up on my GitHub, and I'll post it out on Twitter again this evening. There we go. And for cutting the presentation late, I'll also show you with random choice. <laughs>